Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Monday, April 11th, we are studying Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 53. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives, where he prays in great agony prior to his betrayal and his arrest. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor David Boisclair. Pastor Boisclair serves at Bethesda and Faith Lutheran Churches in North St. Louis County, Missouri. Pastor Boisclair, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Oh, it's great to be here. I want to sharpen my iron. <laughs> That's right. I'm looking forward to this text, Pastor Boisclair. We're, we're on Monday, Thursday still. Give us some of the context as we approach the text we've got from Luke 22 today. Yes. Um, th- this, of course, is, is very and a very important day. Um, uh, this, of course, would be the Jewish Passover um, of that year. And um, it is uh, that that, of course, is the day we always mention it in the words of institution when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, where we say on the day in which he was betrayed. And um, they are coming from the upper room uh, where, where much has much has taken place. Um, the, the Lord, of course, uh is is making a con has made the conscious decision to be um captured by uh his enemies and and of course the enemies of all god's people you might say to uh do what the what the father wanted him to do and and you know i mean it, it just shows the deliberateness of our lord in in going in in setting his face forward and, and to do this because many times when it wasn't the time for this he would um, you know, escape from from being apprehended or or harmed or anything like that. Um, and and th- this is, of course, the time. The hour has come. Um, and it's interesting how in in John's gospel in in John twelve, where where it just says uh, where Jesus begins by saying, "The hour has come." You know, and, and should I say, "Father, save me from this hour." It's for this reason that I was I came into this world. Um, and in this case, they uh, go out of uh, the city and they go to uh, the Mount of Olives and they go to the place where they ha- habitually gathered and probably spent the night there in uh, the um, Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, this, this, of course, uh, was what Jesus was doing at that time. And um, and then, of course, Judas uh, was had left the upper room where they had been celebrating uh, the Passover and and went to uh, uh, take the um, uh, temple police as well as Roman uh, soldiers, probably from the Fortress Antonia to uh, arrest Jesus. So all that has been happening in the background. And now that action really starts to. It really starts to happen in our text today as we see Jesus first go to the Mount of Olives to pray and then his betrayal and his arrest. So let's go ahead and and take a look at what happens when they go out to the Mount of Olives. We're in Luke chapter 22, beginning now at verse 39. And he, Jesus, came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray, that you may not enter into temptation. That takes us through verse 46 of our text. I'll pause there. Pastor Boyscar, you mentioned that 
Jesus going to the Mount of Olives, as Luke tells us, this was his custom. He'd done this regularly. Anything about the, the Mount of Olives geographically as a location that we should know as we think about this text here on Monday, Thursday? Yes, it, it's um, east of Jerusalem. It's it's uh, it's said to be a mount, but it's probably more like a plateau or a, a large hill that's that's over uh, on on the other side of Jerusalem. You can see the temple plainly from it. Uh, one of the uh, members of the Bible class I've been studying showed a picture of when he was in the Holy Land, how where he was standing in what was believed to be the Garden of Gethsemane, and you could see the Dome of the Rock, which is, of course, the uh, the Muslim mosque that now sits on the temple where the temple used to be, and so uh, you know you're you're in plain sight of of the temple, and and you know in in, in another particular uh, day, you know, one of the prior days, Jesus and his disciples were sitting on the Mount of Olives looking at uh, the temple and the, and the city of Jerusalem, where Jesus, of course, gave his uh, uh, discourse on the on the end of the world. And, uh, you know, it, it's interesting in the Mount of Olives, uh, I, I, I like to think of in, in the book of Ezekiel, where uh, the temple is so corrupted by um, uh, the um, the Israelites by in under uh, Zedekiah, uh, where God's uh, glory, uh, the the uh, uh, cr- uh, the cloud and so on, God lifts up His presence from the temple and and lingers on the Mount of Olives before you know uh, before disappearing, and and um, you know it's 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 really a, a a tremendous uh, place uh, in in uh, sacred history, the, the Mount of Olives. With that connection to the book of Ezekiel, I, re- I recall that when we studied Ezekiel, that the glory of the Lord does hang out there for a little while. Is there is there something to Jesus choosing the Mount of Olives as a regular destination of his during Holy Week and even here on Monday, Thursday, that, that we should connect, that, that the glory of God is, is there on the Mount of Olives in Jesus, something like that? Oh, yeah. I think, I think you can... You can uh, have that you know i don't think it's like a direct or a explicit uh teaching it's just that he it was from there probably that he wept over jerusalem you know uh, the city that murders the prophets and scorns those that are sent to her how i would have longed to gather your children as a hen gathers its chicks under its wings and you were not willing and and uh, you know he it was from there that he uh, Bethany is on the Mount of Olives mm-hmm. and he and Bethphage it's kind of like a little uh, sort of a, a suburb or something where he got the they got the um, colt and its and its mother uh, the uh, the donkey that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and and the triumphal entry and so on mm-hmm. and 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 so it's very significant d- during Holy Week. Mm-hmm. Now, Luke says that he they go to the place where they had been accustomed to go. We know from the other Gospels that this is the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where they are. And Jesus tells his disciples there, pray that you may not enter into temptation. T- tell us about what Jesus is, is giving his disciples to do in the prayer, and then what's the temptation that they're going to face? Well, it, it's uh, like the uh, sixth petition in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. Um, there's always a danger when uh, God's people are um, confronted with trials uh, of, to their faith. Um, that, um, you know, it, it's it's kind of like where, we, where you need some extra... Or, or rather, God's protection of you as as you face such a such a difficulty. The, the not only our Lord but also the disciples were tremendously. Uh, you know, they, they Jesus said uh, they're going to arrest me. You know, one of you is going to betray me. I mean, uh, you know, and and, and 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 this is this is really a lot for them to. Uh, uh, to take in, take in, uh, and and they're and they're under a lot of pressure and, and a lot of distress and a lot of anxiety themselves, and um, and so uh, basically Jesus senses this and Jesus knows that they they will need uh, God's help and and so and then of course the the idea is pray that that. Um, you know, when you endure this ordeal, that uh, the devil doesn't have his way with you, uh, as the devil had his way with Judas. 
Um, of course, it was maybe a little easier for him, but uh, in, in this particular case, as, as any of us, whenever we go through a time of trial, there's a danger of us losing our faith. And, and, and um, it's kind of like uh, J- Jesus is amazed at them that they just kind of um, maybe take it a little bit too lightly where they there. It says that they uh, kind of uh, go to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's right. That's how this this text or this portion of the text ends is that they they fail to do this. And I, I, I appreciate the way that you connect it to the Lord's prayer. The sixth petition, lead us not to temptation. And I think we can connect it to the very next one that follows, but deliver us from evil. Yeah, as, as Jesus leads his disciples to the Mount of Olives, keeps them here in the Garden of Gethsemane, he doesn't tell them to pray that the trial would go away because he knows that the trial is going to come. This time of suffering and persecution, that will come. So the prayer is in the midst of that, don't let that temptation overcome us. Don't let us fall away from the faith even in the midst of this evil that surrounds us, deliver us. It doesn't mean that evil won't happen, but it it is a prayer to ask God, don't let the evil have its way with us. As you said, don't let that overcome us to the point that we fall away from Jesus, because that's ultimately the the danger here. And so I I think this is a, this is a good place for us to think about as Christians, you know, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Why, why is prayer such an important weapon for the Christian in the face of temptation? Well, it puts us in, it puts us in communication with our God, the one who uh, desires, always desires to hear from us, always, always wants to, uh, you know, it, it, it actually in, in itself uh, strengthens our faith when we, when we pray. Uh, we don't say that prayer is a means of grace, but, you know, I mean, look at Jesus, our Lord. I mean, all during, you know, some t- when he chose his 12 apostles, he spent the whole night in prayer. You know, if if the, uh, if our Lord, who is absolutely perfect and, and totally connected to God, uh, is one to spend so much time in prayer, how much more should we <laughs> want to uh, engage in, in prayer? Uh, be, you know, it's sort of like when, it, when you're like if you're in a battle and your soldiers in a battle, you want to keep uh, in touch with headquarters. You want to keep in touch with uh, those who have the surveillance or able to see what's going on. Uh, so you might be able to engage uh, in, in fighting the battle against evil. And, and so it, it's, it's like we, we should never, never lose our communication with our source, uh, our Heavenly Father. And I, I think the image of a battle is a good one here, and particularly when we think about prayer. I believe it's in the large catechism where Luther talks about you know, if, if we could see how many arrows the devil always has aimed at us, we would never cease to pray. And it, it's really easy to, to lose sight of that, to, to not recognize the great danger that surrounds us, and not only physically, we maybe are a little more able to see the physical dangers around us, but the constant spiritual danger that's around us, that the devil and his demons would love nothing more than to draw us away from faith in Christ. And we, when we recognize how formidable of an enemy, the evil one actually is, as you said, how much more than do we desire to stay in contact, to be in conversation with our heavenly father, who is our only protection from such evil. And so I, I do think that part of the uh, part of the thing that spurs us on to prayer is recognizing the danger that surrounds us so that we run all the more to the only source we have for protection. Well, yeah. And that, and then of course is why uh, the, the apostle Paul tells us that uh, we, we don't fl- uh, fight against flesh and blood. Now, of course, you know, a lot of times that passage is applied in from Ephesians. It's applied to uh, for us to realize the real enemy is spiritual. The real enemy is Satan and his and his hosts. Um, but uh, the idea is, St. Paul says, what type of enemy are you uh, fighting? Well, you're not fighting something, you know, like a, another human being or other human beings, which are maybe not that uh, much of a challenge to you, but you're fighting against principalities and powers and the rulers of, of evil in, in, in uh, heavenly places. You know, we, we, we um, you know, we're arrayed against uh, the forces of, of darkness and evil. Mm, certainly. I mean, this, this imagery of prayer as a, 
in the terms of spiritual warfare does show up in our our hymns in several places. I I recall the hymn "Rise to Arms with Prayer Employ You." I mean that that whole hymn is one of speaking of prayer and making use of prayer against the fight against Satan. And then the, the other place that I I always think of when it comes to this battle language is. Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress, that the old evil foe means us deadly woe, and we're no equal to him. The only way that that fight is won is if it is our champion, Jesus Christ, who stands with us on the plain. He's the one who can defeat Satan. And if we try to fight on our own, well, that's where we wind up like the disciples on on this night, and we see how, how easily we are conquered. It must be Jesus who does the battle for us. It's, a, it's still very comforting. Uh, you know, in a sense, you know, uh, I, I'm often, you know, as we will look at, as we look further, uh, the, he is he is engaged like in a uh, an athletic contest, you might say. Now, it's more than that, obviously. It's a matter of life and death, his life and death, and what a horrible death that he had to face uh, of, of uh, taking on himself the, the guilt and the, the punishment of all people for all sins. No wonder he sweat blood as he did. Yeah, our, our Lord's suffering here certainly begins in great earnest. I think this is where we really start to see the toll that his suffering and knowing that his suffering is coming. We see the toll that it's taking on him as a, as a human being. So Luke records for us that he, he goes a little ways away from his disciples, about a stone's throw, and he kneels down and he prays. And, and his prayer, I think, is fairly well known. He says, as Luke records it in verse 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Help us, begin to help us, Pastor Boyce Claire, understand what Jesus is praying here. Um, it, what it does is it indicates to us the tremendous pressure and, and um, uh, what, what Jesus was undergoing as a human being. Um, he, of course, he is a human being which ha- who has uh, the person of Jesus has two natures. He's both God and man at the same time, but he's in a state of humiliation where he permits himself to be um, really uh, put under such a horrible ordeal. We we can you know what what's so precious about these uh, passages it, is it shows what it cost Jesus what he went through in other words my sins did this to him and it was necessary in order to save me he had to undergo this this intense and and uh, almost unma- uh, unimaginable suffering that he went through um, and, and but of course it also it, it also indicates to us. Um, they like, it it wasn't as if Jesus was saying, well, can we just forget it? Uh, He was actually saying, uh, might there be any other way possible for us to accomplish our mission? You know, in in other words, uh, but do I have to really do all of this? And, and this, this really speaks to his, uh, his human nature. Um, it's interesting that uh, verses, uh, what is it? uh, 43 and 44 are, omitted uh, because of textual questions. Um, one of the things that was was uh, mentioned that perhaps they may have been omitted from early uh, texts of the Bible from the um, maybe the fourth century because uh, they were used by the Arians who of course denied that our Lord Jesus was God uh, of the same substance as the Father and the Holy Spirit that 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 he uh, so uh, they liked that passage because it really uh, emphasized the what they would consider the weakness of Jesus, um, and um, and then the other the other thing you know where, where it mentions about the the angels strengthening him you know that also uh, you know may, might need to be uh, unpacked uh, then then that he sweat blood as as he did there um, it it again. But it just draws us to him as as we see what he endured for our sakes so that we might not have to. We, we couldn't possibly endure the suffering that he endured. And it's just like what Martin Luther said, that in, in his struggle and his, his journey to uh, the, the gospel, we might say, 
he followed St. Augustine, and St. Augustine was very helpful to him. But there was a point at which St. Augustine was not helping him anymore, so he had he was through with Augustine. And the point was, is that Jesus had to go this alone. There was something that he did in suffering for us and in his redemption that we couldn't possibly do. Augustine emphasizes that Jesus is our example, which he most certainly is. We're like, you know, the Lord calls us on us to fight the good fight of faith. You know, he's the example. He's the guy that we want to see. Look at this. Look at this great spiritual hero that we have before us. He is such an example to us. But there's also the fact that he is our substitute. He is the one that, that had to go it alone. And uh, that, that's kind of expressed in how he said he, he kind of tore himself away from the, uh, the disciples because, you know, he really, uh, misery loves company. You know, as a human being, he wanted to maybe be with somebody that was at least sympathetic to him when he had to endure all of this. So he had to kind of tear himself away to go and, and, and endure this uh, agony. Yeah, the the agony of Jesus here, I think, is and and what it means for us as his people, I think, is is very well expressed in the hymn "Christ, the Life of All the Living," which we sang very recently at a Lenten service here at Grace. And there's so many of the the turns of phrase in this hymn that I think apply, but in particular in stanza three, there's a couple of lines that go like this: "Thou hast suffered sad and lonely." rest to give my weary soul. I mean, I think that's what you're, what you're talking about there, Pastor Boyce. Oh, yeah. is that, you know, Jesus was willing to endure the sadness, the loneliness, the suffering. Why? To give me rest in my weariness. And I, I love this hymn because of that contrast that it continually draws. And it shows how all of the suffering that Christ endured was for my sake and it was in order to give me the exact opposite. I mean, the, that stanza finishes, yea, the curse of God enduring. So Jesus endured the curse, blessing unto me securing. And over and over him, again, this hymn does that. And I, I think that's one of the, the beautiful things that we see here in the Garden of Gethsemane is precisely that, that Jesus begins to experience the, the great fullness of that anguish, that agony also that we might have the blessing and the rest of God. It's such a it's such a beautiful thing. And as you said, it ends up being such a wonderful comfort, not something that we should run away from, but rather something that we should run toward. Because if we see how our Lord has endured this suffering for our sake, it really, I mean, what a comfort for us in our suffering to know that our Lord has experienced the same and even worse, and he has done so for us and for our salvation. It's a beautiful comfort. I, it reminds me of when in, in one of my early, you know, in my early ministry where uh, I had, there were two women who were cousins and they were, they were very advanced in years, you know, in their eighties and nineties. The, the, the one cousin uh, said, assist, uh, uh, she said, uh, cousin, uh, why does God permit me to have to undergo this suffering with my arthritis? I mean, she says, uh, what, what sin did I commit that that I have to undergo this this pain? And and her cousin said, uh, "Now now come on." She said, "Think about what your Savior went through. Think of what Jesus went through." And and uh, he he certainly he he does that to strengthen your faith. But uh, uh, you know it, it's is even as the prophet says, it, "Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto his sorrow." I mean, it, it, it's so encouraging and such a blessing when we think about uh, how our God became a human being and endured this suffering. Mm. Now, as you as we look at his prayer again in verse 42, I, I think the way you said it was helpful. I want to make sure that I, I understand it, that when Jesus prays, if you're willing, remove this cup from me, it's not that he disagrees with his Father's will to save mankind, but what he's asking has to do with the way that that salvation is to be accomplished. If there's another way that doesn't involve his suffering and death, that's what he's asking here because he knows the great pain and anguish that it's going to cost him. Is that is that how we need to understand Jesus prayer here? Oh yes, exactly. And and it wasn't only any any old death. Of course, you know, we have to remember too that G, they could nobody could kill him. You know, he he was not 
uh, he was not killable in the sense that someone else would decide it. Uh, he says, uh, I have the authority to uh, lay down my life and I have the authority to take it up again. This I have this command, this uh, uh, teaching I received from my father. And so, uh, you know, he decided to die when he died on the cross. He didn't die. Uh, they, they, they didn't take it from him. Uh, he he uh, cried out with a loud cry and, and gave up his life. Uh, and and um, in, in this particular case, it's the idea. It's not only uh, like sometimes our our beloved uh, members and so on. They they go through death, and it's and we might say it's a blessed death. But in the case of our Lord Jesus, it was it was gonna, it's something totally horrendous. He was suffering all of the hell that all human beings uh, would would be liable to endure on the basis of God's law. And he, his, he, he received the condemnation of his father. He became a curse for us that we might receive the righteousness that he, that he won. Yeah, I mean, and that, again, this is what Jesus is beginning to feel the great anguish of that here in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's going to build as the passion narrative continues to that moment when he cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is what Jesus is beginning to experience and feel right now. He knows how it's going to get worse. And so he prays there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we're going to pick up more of this text on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We are talking Luke chapter 22 with Pastor David Boisclair. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, April 11th. We are studying Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 53 with Pastor David Boisclair. He serves at Bethesda and Faith Lutheran Churches in North St. Louis County, Missouri. Pastor Boisclair, prior to the break, we were looking at Jesus' prayer, and we've been talking a lot about the suffering that Jesus is beginning to endure, the suffering that he knows that is coming. And within the prayer that Jesus says, He speaks of it in terms of a cup. He says, remove this cup from me. What does the image of the cup entail? Why does Jesus speak about his suffering as a cup? In the Old Testament, uh, the prophets oftentimes mention God's uh, judgment upon the nations as as a cup of his wrath. Uh, And and it's, uh, so, so in other words, it's something that refers to uh, enduring the judgment and and suffering of God, and um, and so in, in other words, the the suffering that he that was endured because of God's wrath against His people, um, you know, and their sin and their and their uh, disobedience to Him. And well, even you you have cups of wrath that are uh, you know that even the other nations are made to drink, mm-hmm. even those that are not uh, the Israelites. Right. This image of of cup shows up in several places. I think Jeremiah 25 is one of those places where it's every nation imaginable, the Lord says, is going to drink from this cup of wrath. So when Jesus says, remove this cup, what what he's understanding is that he is about to drink down to the dregs, the very bottom of the cup, all of God's wrath. And, And that thought of the suffering that's going to come from it, that's what he's saying if there's a way to do this another way, remove this cup. Let let's do it another way if we can. Is that that essentially it? I don't want to th- drink that yes, cup to I, the full. Yes, yes, exactly. And 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 I mean, it's a demonstration of his uh, being uh, a a fully human being. He is he is so purely human, and I mean, you know, he's pure God and he's pure man, and and he and and as any human being would say, you know. You know, it just enduring this suffering, um, uh, 
that uh, it, it, it's just uh, it just indicates to us how human he was. Right. And again, that provides comfort to us in our humanity to know that the Lord himself has endured and suffered in the same ways that we do. And even worse, that brings us comfort as we suffer in our humanity as well. Now, the other uh, really important feature of the prayer that Jesus speaks is the matter of his Father's will and then how his own will, Jesus' own will, relates to that. Help us to see how Jesus prays with the Father's will in mind, even as his own will is there too. Yes. Um, obviously, the Father's will as God is is uh, di- the divine will, which Jesus also possesses because he is God. He is the uh, second person of the Holy Trinity, and so he has a divine will as well, which, of course, would be completely uh, on the same page with uh, the Father and the Holy Spirit's will. But then he also has a human will here. And, um, and, and in, in a sense, he, he, he is subjecting his human will to, his, to the divine will. Um, and, and, of course, it doesn't seem to be any argument or any, any problem. He, he, it's, um, uh, you know, he says, thy will be done. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and in a sense, it's, that's, that's also a very strong way in which well, we as Christians, uh, you know, it, it, it's like when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we, we, we have there is the petition right there. So you see a lot of elements of the two elements of the Lord's Prayer in this whole event in the life of Jesus. One of the things I wanted to mention was uh, for the for the first uh, 800 years of the church's existence, the Holy Christian Church, from the time of our Lord until uh, the year 787, the church was engaged in determining, you know, just how does God and man uh, come together in this person of Jesus Christ? And and uh, there were seven councils, ecumenical councils, that were uh, called and dealt with all of this. The sixth ecumenical council, which happened in 681, 80 and 81 AD dealt with uh, folks that were saying, well, Jesus only had one will, you know, because, uh, you know, he's God. And, and, you know, there were there, like two sides of it. There's some sides that, that didn't, that wanted to emphasize his human nature and then kind of separate his human nature from his divine nature. And the other side wanted to kind of nix the whole human nature altogether. And so they said he had one will and and it was determined on the basis of this verse that he had a human will that there was two that he has two wills he has a divine will and he has a human will and and it is was his intention of conforming his human will to his divine will yeah i mean another lenten hymn that i think beautifully expresses what's going on here is the hymn a lamb goes uncomplaining forth which is number 438 in the lutheran service book and it, it, it's a Paul Gerhardt hymn. It's a fantastic text. And it, it pictures this conversation essentially between the father and the son, where the father says, go forth, my son, free my children from their dread. And then the son responds, yes, father, yes, most willingly, I'll bear what you command me. My will conforms to your decree. I'll do what you have asked me. And I think that's a, a fantastic way of picturing what's going on here in the prayer that Jesus speaks to his father. And you're mentioning the Lord's prayer and the way it shows up, even just the address that Jesus gives to his father, that's the Lord's prayer, our father. That's how we're taught. And Jesus here speaks in that faith to his father. I mean, even in the midst of the suffering that's coming, as he prays in great agony, as he knows the suffering that's going to be entailed, still he speaks to God as his father, which is also such a marvelous example to us and a great comfort to us as Christians to know that in the midst of our suffering, God remains our father too. Amen. And, you know, it's interesting, Luther kind of put it this way. He, he says that the, 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 the child of God prays, yeah, Father, thy will be done. And, 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 and God answers, yes, my child, despite the devil and the world and all the powers really mm. <laughs> that are against you. <laughs> mm. Talk a little bit more about moving on from Jesus' prayer, what happens in conjunction with him, the angel that strengthens him, the great agony and the sweat like drops of blood. The, it seems that this is just emphasizing to us the great suffering that our Lord endured for our sake. Yes, and and uh, the the angels 
uh, are play a big part in Jesus's uh, ministry on earth uh, after his uh, uh, his temptation and his his fasting and uh, forty day fast, which of course is what Lent is is all about. Um, he the angels came and ministered to him. Um, in this particular case, it's it it it's a time when Jesus really doesn't kind of you know his human nature doesn't want to be alone but he realizes he has to be so then uh the father sends this angel to to strengthen him as 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 it says it it, it you know the angel appears the angel the word in greek is is ophthe uh which means that that the angel uh, was seen or appeared to him um an angel from heaven and so it was it was from uh, his heavenly father strengthening him. So, you know, it, it, it's rather interesting. I don't know if, if maybe some of our listeners may have seen the uh, Mel Gibson film, The Passion of the Christ. And, and there is some things in that film that are not um, according to scripture and, and everything there. But it's interesting when Jesus is enduring the sufferings uh, of his great passion, that there is one point where, you know, he it seems like he must be at the end of his endurance and then all of a sudden he he gains an extra added uh burst of strength and so this angel of course uh you know in other words mediates that to him from the father so so in in kind of what we what we understand and then there there is this uh is something which is is certainly a um uh a medical condition for human beings it's called hematidrosis uh, where 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 sweat where one sweats blood, um, and 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 this and this is this is actually something that has that occurs that somebody that's under a tremendous amount of pressure, uh, their little blood vessels uh, where their sweat glands are, uh, you know, mingle blood with the sweat. And it was like great, great drops, or the word is the word uh, thromboy means uh, clots of blood falling to the ground. The the appearance of the angel, I think, is you mentioned how the angel comes to Jesus after his temptation. I think the appearance of the angel here in the Garden of Gethsemane heightens that connection between the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness and then the way that Satan is active even here. You know, Satan is, is active in the passion all along. He's he's waited for this opportune time, as Luke reminded us back in chapter four. And now here he is trying to get Jesus to avoid the cross. And so I think the the appearance of the angel heightens the awareness of the spiritual conflict that's happening here, which we know from the, the temptation earlier that Jesus will triumph yet again. And we will see how that plays out in the rest of the passion narrative. When Jesus finished pray, finishes praying, he gets up, goes back to his disciples, finds them sleeping for sorrow, and repeats his command for them to get up and continue to pray so they don't fall fall into temptation. Anything more from the way that this section closes, Pastor Boyce Claire, before we move to the next part of our text? Well, it, it's it, it, in a sense, it's it, it shows the humanness of his disciples. How how weak sometimes are we as well that that we may not. Um, uh, measure up to what is expected of us by the Lord, um, but but again, uh, it is He who meets us with His mercy and and forgiveness, and He's the one that strengthens us. And that's why any time uh, when when we're called upon to do something for the Lord, yes, I'll do it with Your help, with by the grace of God, with the help by the help of God, and 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 so it it, it it's kind of like. Uh, the, you know, we're we're thankful that the Lord who inspired the, these words of his um, Dr. Luke. And by the way, it, it, you know, it's interesting mentioning that uh, the sweaty, bl- the bloody sweat is sort of something that a doctor like Luke would know about. Yeah. But uh, that this is for our sake, you know. So in other words, don't be don't be slack in in uh, your spiritual life. You know, you know, you need to be you need to be praying. Uh, it kind of reminds me of an old uh, spiritual song, which when, uh, you know, they say, oh, sinner man, where are you going to run to? I, uh, uh, the, the Lord said, sinner man, you should have been a praying. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, and certainly here, that is Jesus' repeated command, rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then Luke continues in the midst of Jesus' speech. So we pick up the text in verse 47 now. 
While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. That's the rest of our text for today. That was Luke 22, verses 47 to 53. Pastor Boyskler, this section begins with Judas leading this crowd, and he draws near to kiss Jesus. Jesus speaks. Take us into that interaction between Judas and Jesus. Well, it's rather interesting in the uh, in the upper room where uh, Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus is very troubled. And, and you might say that, that he's really trying to maybe reach out to Judas. Judas could have been forgiven. Peter was forgiven for denying uh, Jesus three times. Um, you know, and, and then Jesus says, one of you will betray me. Is it I? Is it I? You know, I, I can just imagine myself there and saying, not me. Certainly not me. Uh, and then, and then, of course, he tells Judas to do what he is what he is to do. You know, he, he um, and so Judas leaves. And it's interesting. John's gospel says that when Judas leaves the upper room, it was night, mm. it says. Um, then uh, Judas, uh, you know, again, you know, Jesus shows his compassion. You know, there might have been a possibility for Judas to to have repented, uh, but uh, Jesus says he is the son of perdition. You know, none is lost except the son of perdition. Or he said, I haven't I chosen you the 12 and one of you is a devil. Um, in, in this particular case, you know, that was Judas said, this is going to be how I'm going to indicate who, who uh, Jesus is. You know, who, who's the one you're going to arrest by going up to him and kissing him. And, and what an irony that is, isn't it? Certainly. Yeah. The, the sign that should be one of most intimate affection and closeness is used as a, an act of terrible treachery. It's, it's incredibly and sadly ironic. And I think, I mean, you, you see the, the pain that it caused Jesus. And I, I think that's worth at least a moment of meditation that this is one of the 12 closest people to Jesus during his earthly ministry. And I think sometimes we forget that because we know that Judas is the bad guy. And I mean, just you say the name Judas and you kind of get these chills because you know he's the betrayer. But he was one of the 12. He was one of the closest people to Jesus during his ministry. And now he comes and he betrays his Lord with a kiss. That had to hurt. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think sometimes we forget that, that this is yeah. part of the Lord's suffering is that one of his very own closest friends actually betrays him with a kiss. That, that stings. And that's probably putting it lightly. Well, and it's even uh, prophesied in the Psalms, the one who was my dear companion has lifted up his heel against me. You know, and like in the case, uh, you know, uh, and, and the, the Psalter, of course, is, is always like in the person of Jesus. It's kind of as if uh, our Lord Jesus is the one that speaks the words of the Psalms. And, and in this case, uh, Ju you know, Judas's own name has, has, is now uh, itself a... a um, a derogatory term, you know, you are a Judas, you're a Judas, uh, you know, and, and it's, 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 uh, just a legend, a legendary example. You know, it's interesting too. I don't know whether it, it's probably appropriate. Well, to mention that, that the, the basic, um, uh, popular, uh, interest in vampires say that Judas, of course, became a vampire because mm. he uh, committed suicide and so on. I don't, I don't believe that. But, you know, the thing is, is, is Judas uh, takes the coins of the 30 pieces of silver, throws them back in the temple and and then um, you know, proceeds to go out and hang himself. And that's that's the sad thing. It wasn't the fact that he killed himself. That was the bad thing was that he despaired. Mm. You know, he could have been restored. He could have been restored. Yeah, yeah. Then that that does make Judas just a terribly tragic figure. That yeah, he could have been restored, but he did not repent. He, he despaired. 
Now, from this moment, the kiss happens, Jesus has been identified, and there's kind of this moment where it, things are hanging in the balance. You're not sure which way it's going to, to go. And the people who are following Jesus are, are ready. They're, they're asking him, should we do something? Should we strike with a sword? And before they even get an answer, one of them does. And he cuts off the, the, high, the servant of the high priest. They cut off that person's ear before Jesus stops. And then he actually heals the man. Take us into that brief interaction where it almost gets violent. Yes, in the upper room, Jesus uh, tells his disciples the time is coming that you'll sell your sell your cloak and, and, and anything else to get a sword. And and then they say, here are two swords. <laughs> and, and Jesus says, that's enough. <laughs> and then and now I, I don't mean it's not funny, but now in the Garden of Gethsemane, obviously, uh, you know, Peter is the one that, that has a short sword with him. And uh, here, you know, they, they say, should we strike with the sword? And, and, then, and then, of course, Peter lashes out, as, as he often does. Uh, you know, he, he, he does first and then thinks later and, and cuts off uh, Malchus. Uh, we know from uh, John's gospel that it's, the, it's Malchus. Uh, Luke, of course, uh, Dr. Luke tells us that Jesus healed his ear. Uh, did he pick it up off the ground or was it hanging by a, a by a thread and, and Jesus touched it and, and healed it, but he healed Malchus's ear. And, and the idea there would be to protect the Peter and any of the other uh, apostles from being apprehended. Hmm. Well, and, and I think it fits very well with what Jesus will pray later from the cross, where he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. As he As he hangs there from the cross dying, he prays for the people who put him there. Here, in the case of the one of the people who's there to arrest him, even then Jesus still shows compassion and heals them. And yes, what you're saying about you know protecting his disciples certainly, but even the compassion he's got for one of his enemies is another one of these features that you see running through the Gospels. Yes, and you know, and it's interesting. One of the uh, interpreters, uh, Lenski, of course, in, in my my day, uh, that Lenski was the main. Um, you know, commentary we use, but Lenski says, well, uh, so much for the the necessity of faith uh, to receive mm-hmm. the healing. Um, that the, and, and and he makes a good point there that that Jesus heals uh, ne- maybe people that do have faith and maybe people that do not have faith. Although maybe Malchus did have faith, mm-hmm. but but the point is 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 that this is the final. Um, miracle that our Lord does. Hmm. Yeah, and and for the sake of one of the people there to arrest him, it's wonderful mercy from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before they take him away, Jesus speaks, and he, he says, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Help us to understand what Jesus is saying to his captors here. Yeah. Yes, he um, <clears throat> he's he's basically calling them out with mm-hmm. uh, you know because obviously these are the leaders uh, the the religious leaders of God's people in this day and age and 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 look at what you're doing you know take a look at what you're doing you you know you're doing it in in the dead of night. Uh, you know, even there were laws in, in the con- conduct of the business of the Sanhedrin that it could not be conducted in at night. It had to be conducted in the light of day. And, and here you are, um, you know, coming out against me. There were probably, they, you know, some commentators say there might have been 400 uh, armed people, that there were the temple guards and then there were also the um, Roman soldiers from the Fortress Antonia here. And um, in the, and then then of course Jesus is saying, well, you know, this is this is the uh, authority of darkness. The word is exousia in the Greek. Uh, so so you have the presence of Satan, and and in other words, he's he's being given an upper hand here, uh, so that he can finally be defeated. Mm. Talk a little bit more about that last part, Pastor Boyce Clear, because it is it, it almost sounds a bit strange where he says this is your hour in the power of darkness. You were saying earlier that Jesus chooses this hour. In John's gospel he even talks about this is my hour that he's been going to. So in in what sense does Jesus mean that this is your hour, the authority of darkness? What is what does that mean? How do those two things go together? Well, God is obviously allowing them to um, take his son 
to and, and to do him to death. Um, so, so in a sense, it, it, in order to destroy death and swallow up death forever, you know, the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, consigns himself to um, the power of his enemies. I, I love the uh, Walther's hymn, uh, Easter hymn, where he says, In Satan's domains did the hosts shout and jeer, for Jesus was slain, whom the evil ones fear. But short was their triumph, the Savior arose, and death, hell, and Satan, he vanquished his foes. You know, it's it, it, it's sort of like, well, this is, okay, this is your time, you know. You know, as as God predicted to our, our first parents, you know, you will crush his, uh, he will crush your head, and you will crush his heel. So, so they're going to, uh, you know, basically take him to the cross, and they're going to, uh, you know, and it's interesting in, in the apostolic, um, preaching in, in Acts, it says if the if the evil powers really realized what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of Glory, and 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 so, uh, you know, ultimately darkness will end, <laughs> and darkness will be put to flight. Well, and in that sense, it it that fits very well with what you said about Jesus calling them out here. Like, is this what you want to be known for? That this is your hour when you crucify the Lord of Glory? Then then okay, have at it. But you will see that even when you do your worst, that the Son of Man reigns triumphant, that even though the devil strikes him on the heel, yet he, the Son of Man, crushes the serpent's head. And that's where all this is headed. So even though they do their worst to Jesus at this hour, when darkness is given this authority to do this to Jesus, nonetheless, Jesus comes out triumphant. Got about three minutes here, Pastor Boyce, to wrap things up. Help us to see the good news from this section of Luke 22, Jesus' agony in the garden and his betrayal and arrest. How is this good news for us as Christians? It, it, well, it's good news that uh, the only one that was able to take on the task of, of uh, redeeming the world, reconciling the Father to us, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their tra- trans- transgressions against them. He, he, he charged them against his son. His son is the only one that was able to, to make a perfect redemption for all of the sins of the world. And at his resurrection, of course, God justified the entire world of sinners so that we have the, uh, the, the certainty of our forgiveness that is delivered to us through the gospel, the hearing of the gospel and the holy sacraments, uh, where, where um, basically what Jesus has won for us. You know, he's our valiant hero. He's the one that has taken our place and swallows up death forever. He has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. All of this is for you and for me, for sinners. His agony is for you. His betrayal is for you. His arrest, his suffering, the darkness that he endured, all of it is for you. He does this in your place to redeem you from darkness, from sin, from death, from evil. And even as we watch our Lord go through this agony, knowing that it is for us, is a great comfort in the gospel. Pastor David Boisclair is pastor at Bethesda and Faith Lutheran Churches in North St. Louis County, Missouri, helping us today with Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 53. Pastor Boisclair, thanks for being our guest today. Well, my my thanks to you and, and blessings during this Lenten and in Easter season. I'm your pat I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Luke 22 or any of the gospel, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or use the open mic feature on the app to send a message to us. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.